President, Vice President, members of council, deans, heads of school, faculty and distinguished guests, you're all very, very welcome to RCSI this evening for, for a very special event. Uh, this guest lecture is de delivered by Dr. Siddhartha Mukherjee and my colleague, Dr. Neve, Professor Neve Moran, will introduce it in more detail. I think we're in for a very special lecture, a lecture titled Three Visions of a Medical Future, Genes, Risk and Precision. I, I think gives us some sense of what's ahead of us. I, I'm delighted to welcome you to RCSI. Many of you are familiar with us. For some of you, it's perhaps your first time to the college. RCSI was founded in 1784, initially as a surgical college. Today, we are Ireland's only independent, not-for-profit, focused health sciences institution, with undergraduate schools of physiotherapy, pharmacy, medicine, School of Postgraduate Studies, School of Healthcare Management, a significant research institute. We pride ourselves in being totally focused on healthcare and health sciences. We also take pride in the fact that we're very internationally focused. For many, many years, RCSI has been the, fr the front line of international students coming to Ireland, but also we have a presence overseas with our training institute in Dubai, our university in Bahrain, two medical schools in Malaysia, and we are the largest working with Irish aid supporter of surgical training in the 14 countries that make up the COSEXA area of West and Southern Africa, making a significant contribution to the delivery of surgical care in that region. We at RCSI have spent the last year uh, crafting our strategy as we go forward, uh, in some ways uh, celebrating the establishment of this building and as we plan our future campus and our future as a health sciences institute, looking at how we can make a contribution to healthcare locally and, and globally. And to us, it's very clear that we live in an age of constraint, where the real big medical issue of our time is, how can we provide high quality, safe and effective care to growing populations with increasingly complex diseases, with increasingly expensive treatments, with, with less. And it's a combination of increasing the scope of practice of existing professions, conceiving new professions, making impactful discovery on the early treatment, prevention and diagnosis of disease, and furthermore, engaging with society, and, and both locally and internationally, in education, in programs designed to prevent and manage diseases early. So it's particularly pertinent that we have a scientist, a clinician of the caliber of Dr. Siddhartha Mukherjee to address us tonight. Well, it's, a, it's an immense honor to be able to talk today. Um, and thank you for inviting me. This is a, a great, great institution that I've admired for all my life. And it's been a, a real pleasure to come here and be able to talk. Um, I, um, in some ways, this is a, an, an unusual talk to give because this audience is simultaneously very clinically sophisticated, scientifically sophisticated. But I want to go backwards and ask some questions that are, that may be um, more relevant to us as a society as a whole. Um, and one of the things I want to achieve in this talk is to paint with you a picture of, of a medical future in cancer, um, what, what happens next, um, and how it might affect us, and whether we're culturally, socially, biologically uh, prepared for that moment, and what its consequences might be if we move forward. How does this scale to the rest of the world? What happens? What are the consequences for us um, understanding our own bodies in, in this manner? Um, I want to begin by um, something that was written about the Emperor of All Maladies when the, the book first came out. It first came out in 2010. And this was a review that was then published in The New Yorker. Um, and it ended um, I, I, with, a, with a place that I didn't fully then understand. In fact, the technology was not even there to understand. Uh, this, this was a final comment about the review. But I actually grew to understand it more, um, especially as my own family matured and entered a, a kind of life of illness. My own father, written about it, my own father entered life of illness. Stephen Shapin, um, a historian of medicine, wrote, a world in which cancer is uh, normalized as a manageable chronic condition would be a wonderful thing. But then he goes on to say, but a risk factor world in which we all think of ourselves 
as precancerous as people waiting to have cancer would not. Um, it might decrease the incidence of some forms of malignancy while hugely increasing the numbers of healthy people under medical treatment. So here he's, he's raising the question of what it means to be overdiagnosed. Of course, that's a medical term. But he's also raising the question of what it means to be under surveillance from a disease you haven't yet had. Um, it, the, the word that was not used there here, but has actually come into language since then, is the word previvor. A previvor is a survivor of a disease that you haven't yet had. Um, <laughs> Uh, that, of course, generates a, a, a kind of a flitter of, of, of humor. But imagine now being that person. Imagine being under risk or being under surveillance for future risk. Um, and, and think about what that would mean to us uh, as, as human beings. And finally, Shapin concludes, it would be a strange victory in which the price to be paid for checking the spread of cancer through the body is its uncontrolled spread through the culture. Um, I think there were interesting words, interesting idea. Um, what's in, what was to me most remarkable that when this was written in 2010, we did not have really the technology and the tools to understand risk in this way. We had the potential, but we didn't have the tools. In the eight odd years that have passed since then, we have entered this world in a very forceful way. We've entered a world where, where the spread of cancer through the body um, is becoming uh, uh, is becoming tantamount to its uncontrolled spread through the culture. Um, Susan Sontag, writing very famously, as you might know, um, uh, a cultural critic but also a writer, um, concluded her or, or sorry, pardon me, began her uh, book um, *Illness as Metaphor* by arguing that uh, every person has simultaneous citizenship between the kingdom of the well and the kingdom of the ill, as she described it. But in Sontag's time, there was a bi-directional passage. You could enter the kingdom of the ill and then come back to the kingdom of the will. Um, you had, as, as Sontag herself would describe, you had passports to both kingdoms. Um, my, the fear that Shapin is trying to um, uh, illustrate and the fear that I think is, is the center of this talk is whether we have now stopped the bi-directional passage. Once you enter the kingdom of the ill, you are always under surveillance you're always under the threat of future illness, and you become a locus of risk. Um, and of course, it would be a remarkable thing if we could use that to decrease uh, all illnesses and the possibility of death, uh, or delay the possibility of death uh, from illness because of that surveillance. But I want to also take a moment as we move forward to consider what it would mean um, uh, for our bodies, ourselves, and our cultures. Um, so, to summarize then, I'm going to put the summary of the talk right in front because it's going to be quite complicated things coming down the road. Um, we are beginning to understand cancer at a cellular and molecular level. Um, this understanding, I, I, I think, has highlighted the enormous diversity of individual cancers. We'll talk about that, that understanding from capital C cancer, cancer is a single disease, to the idea that every individual cancer has its own um, set of genetic mutations, has its own behavior, and in fact maybe need to be treated in a, in, in a way that's, uh, that, that is relatively individualized. Um, this diversity may, the emphasis is on may, demand precision or partly individualized therapies. I don't think we will get to a place where every single patient is treated individually. I think that would <laughs> break our understanding of what it would mean to deliver precision medicine at scale at, to many, many, many patients. But I do think that we will begin to parse human beings, human cancers, into individual parts. Breast cancer will come in thousands of genetic and, and epigenetic subtypes, um, which will then demand individualized therapies for those subtypes. Um, and also, we, we know that early treatment is likely to bring benefits. If you put these two points together, this, this, the, the, the notion of diversity um, and, and the fact that early treatment uh, is likely to bring benefits, then um, detecting early and treating precisely are, are likely to be themes in the medical future of cancer. This really falls out of the first, the last two um, pieces. And, and then comes the, the, the piece that I want to consider uh, ultimately, which is that however such a world of surveillance, diagnosis, and treatment carries cultural burdens that we are, I, I, would, I would argue, still unprepared for. Um, and that's really the, the focus and the center of, of, of this talk about genes, risk, and precision. So I'm, I'm going to actually take an unusual break here and, and, and um, take you to a moment in, in, in the film that I did with Ken.
Um, this was for PBS. Um, it was a vast production, um, ultimately reaching several, uh, several million viewers um, uh, for three nights. But I was particularly moved by one tiny episode uh, of, of, of a woman entering this world, um, a, a woman entering this world of genetic risk and precision medicine. And that's the story of Lori Wilson. Lori Wilson is a breast surgeon. Um, she is a teacher, she is still alive today, is a teacher, um, and um, her practice um, is um, in the, in, uh, at a, a major hospital uh, near Baltimore. And in the middle of her practice as a breast surgeon, she gets uh, ironically diagnosed with bilateral breast cancer herself. Um, and she goes back in a very moving moment. This was actually captured in film in an unanticipated way. We heard news and she was extraordinarily generous to let us uh, allow us to film her journey with, uh, with her um, as a, really as, a, as something that, that her residents could learn from. She's an extraordinary human being. Um, but um, she goes back then to her own professor uh, who, she, who she had trained with to have her mastectomy uh, done. Um, and this is a moment in which she's just about to catch the flight, um, but entering, this, this piece was called, on the cutting floor, it was called um, uh, uh, Welcome to Cancer Land. Um, entering this world of ge genetic risk surveillance, she then gets genetically tested, she then enters her, uh, uh, her chemotherapy, and finally enters a, a world in which she is technically cured of the cancer, but she has to continuously monitor herself and be continuously monitored for future risk of cancer. She has now acquired that one directional passage into the world of the ill. So I'm gonna break here and I'm gonna ask for some help because I don't know how to operate these fancy uh, pieces. This is a short clip from the film called Welcome to Cancer Land or Laurie Wilson's Haircut. <laughs> At least he tasted it. You're a funny boy. You know that? Mommy likes cherries. It's been a month since Lori's diagnosis and her 20-week oh. regimen of chemotherapy has begun. Mommy likes them. Yum, 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 yum. I dare you! <laughs> yes. Hello, wife, Lori. Hey, how you doing? Nice to meet you. Thank you for coming. I'll go first. Yeah. Thank you. Well, my husband first. actually is going to shave his head with me, and so we will, until my hair grows back, we'll both be bald together. Wow. He's my rock. He's been there for everything. He's looking good. Y'all forget I've been bald headed before 20 years ago. Yeah, before Lori and I got together in the first winter when I grew my hair, and then Lori liked my hair when I haven't shaved it since. Oh, what a story. Yes, sweet. So cute. Oh, Next. I don't buy into the why me, um, because so much of cancer is not predictable, it is not set on family history or any feature, and so absolutely could be me. Hey, Nay Nay, you recognize mommy? Oh. I have a 19 month old, and I want to see my son grow up, see my son get married, and go to grad school and you know, all the, the good stuff that uh, we expect for family. And uh, with this diagnosis, um, that's more difficult uh, thing to see. 
get back in. I, I make all my students watch that um, until it, it's unbearable. And, and the reason is because as we, uh, as we are trying to find, uh, invent new therapies for cancer, we uh, have no idea until we become patients ourselves what it's like to enter this world. Um, and I think it's absolutely important um, as in the profession of medicine to understand what, what it's like being on the other side because we will be on the other side at some point of time as well, but also because that's fundamentally about what we do in, in, um, in the delivery of medicine. Um, I'm gonna take a little bit of a tour then to bring us up to this place, um, the so-called welcome to cancer land space. Um, and uh, it'll be a little bit of a detour through history, um, a couple of slides, and then I'm gonna talk a little more deeply about uh, precision risk and, and what it means for the future. So um, long before uh, the word cancer existed, long before the, even the idea of cancer existed, um, the question um, of uh, what it would mean to diagnose cancer uh, was there because cancer is an ancient illness. We didn't know words for it. We didn't have the language or the vocabulary for it. This is probably the first time uh, cancer is described in human history. Uh, it's, this is from the Edwin Smith papyrus, um, described as a mass uh, uh, in the breast, as dense and cold as a hemat fruit. Um, and this, uh, this was actually a, a surgical document. Many of you are familiar with this with papyrus. Um, and, and one of the things that, that, that's written in the document is that there is no treatment. Uh, there was no way, at least the ancient surgeons had no way to, to find a treatment. Um, and the word cancer uh, didn't arise until much later. Um, it was, it's rumored, we don't know, that Hippocrates himself uh, used the word cancer partly because, uh, or the word carcinos rather, because the, uh, he imagined, or the contemporaneous surgeons imagined the disease. It looked like a crab buried underneath the sand because uh, all the blood vessels around it were like the legs of the crab. Other people think that it has to do with the movement of cancer in the body, the metast metastatic quality of cancer in the body. But nonetheless, this metaphor stuck um, uh, through history. Um, and the, once that word was coined, it somehow described so many things, we began to find metaphors within that metaphor of cancer, um, using that idea to describe this, this uh, set of illnesses. But what the cause was, what, why, why uh, these uh, illnesses arose in the first place, remained an enormous mystery. Um, until um, really work done by several people I'm here highlighting, work done by Verkau, um, Verkau was a cellular physiologist, a pathologist, um, but Verkau um, was interested in, in a, he began uh, with very simple tenets, very simple ideas, very simple principles. Um, and that um, idea um, was uh, the idea that, uh, that all cells came from other cells, that they didn't arise out of, um, out of the blue, out of, uh, they did not arise from miasma or from, from some kind of gaseous substance, that the only way a cell could arise was from a previous cell, like a radical idea in its time. We take it uh, vastly for accepted, uh, but a radical idea in its time. And um, if you then thought through that process, if you thought, thought to the process of if all cells arise, arose from other cells, and Verkau also, along with his uh, contemporaries, realized that cancer was a cellular disease. It was a disease of cellular growth, cellular aberration. Whenever he looked at uh, pathological specimens, he found an overabundance of cells. He, uh, he wondered whether it was actually the growth of cells that was uh, out of control. But if you thought about that, you quickly realized that if cancer cells arose from cells, then they must arise in turn from normal cells. So something must have happened, uh, some activity must have happened to convert a normal cell into a cancer cell. And the question then became, what was that? What, what, what had happened? Uh, um, the process was later known as transformation because obviously something vast had changed in the physio physiology of the cell. A normal cell knows when to stop dividing. Um, one idea that I like to plant, in, again, with my students when I, when I talk to them is, it's astonishing to me that when you cut yourself, you don't grow a new hand. Uh, what prevents us, like trees, uh, from constantly growing new limbs and branches? Obviously, some process, which we still don't fully understand. We understand some principles of it, 
but you would be, you know, this is one of those mysteries that keeps thickening the more you study biology. Why is it that, that a wound knows how to heal itself um, and then stop healing, whereas obviously many tumors don't know how to stop uh, growing. Their cellular s systems are, are aberrant, but Virchow didn't know that. Um, and for a long time, the only solution to this was to remove the, without understanding the cause, was to remove the, uh, the, the, the lesion, the culprit lesion. Um, and that, of course, led to the golden age of cancer surgery. We will come back to cancer surgery um, as the mainstay of cancer therapy, the pillar on which early cancer therapy is still, for solid tumors, still is built. Um, but, uh, but the idea then eventually, as I describe in the book, um, many, many times we'll see this coming over and over again, the, a very successful, powerful idea becomes a seduction in itself in cancer. It becomes a, a, a fully a circular, the logic becomes fully circular, and that was circularized. That logic was made fully internal by William Stuart Halstead, the great surgeon, who um, began to advance the theory that if local, uh, if, a, if local therapy for breast cancer was, was good, then more local therapy was better, and even more local therapy was even better, thereby progressing therapy slowly towards an ultra-radical, and then his students towards a super-radical mastectomies that were popular in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. Um, this is a quote from Halstead, which I found very moving. The patient was a young woman who I was loath to disfigure, um, but the idea that you had to somehow intrude or invade a person's body and make them undergo a sacrifice of, of the self in order to get rid of the cancer um, was very much part of the seduction of this um, early period of radical therapy for surgery. But it wasn't until really the 1960s, 70s, and 80s, uh, decades after the success of, uh, of, of, of surgical therapy for cancer tipping over towards the ex excess of radical surgery, that we began to understand what that mysterious cause that had, had, had fascinated Virchow was. Um, uh, many people were involved in this work. I'm not going to take individual names. but. The, the idea that came out of the 1980s in cancer was a truly transformative idea. And that is that cancer occurs when uh, normal growth controlling genes, metabolism controlling genes are mutated and these mutations thereby fail to tell a cell how to stop growing and, and co-opt the physiology of the cell towards uh, uh, malignant growth. To some extent, uh, they also occasionally tell a cell to stop dying, but really it is a, it, it is a compound or it's, it's a consequence of mutations in genes that ultimately cause cells uh, to stop uh, knowing how to regulate their normal physiological growth. And this was described by Harold Varmus and others by picking up uh, a lovely uh, phrase from Beowulf um, in which he described cancer as a distorted version of our normal selves. Um, and, of course, that explained this idea that cancer arose as a consequence of mutations in normal cellular genes, in genes that are present in every cell, but mutations in those genes, those growth-controlling genes, uh, ultimately uh, unleashed uh, cancerous growth, was, a, was an idea that sent a real chill up the spines of the entire field of cancer biology because the very genes that cause our wounds to heal, our cells to grow, our blood to be able to fight uh, infections, uh, those very genes in their mutated form, uh, in their mutated mutant forms were now implicated as, uh, as cancers, uh, as, as causal for cancer. The other thing that was very important is that they solved a very particular mystery that had been raging in the field for a very long time, which is uh, we knew that, that, that heredity was involved in cancer uh, because you had familial risk of cancer. Um, this is a picture of uh, of, the, of, the, uh, of the Brazilian ophthalmologist, uh, Hilario de Juvia, um, who had tracked uh, retinoblastoma, eye cancers, uh, very rare, unusual cancers, uh, crisscrossing through a particular Brazilian family, but eventually found in many other families. So their heredity was involved. Um, here is a picture of Percival Pott, uh, 
uh, Sir Percival Pott, who, as many of you know, um, was among the first to uh, coin the idea that some factor in the environment, um, which he called, he actually coined the term carcinogen, uh, something that would give rise to cancer, some factor in the environment could also cause cancer. He, he did this by famously associating chimney sweepers, young boys uh, who swept chimneys, um, with a high risk of a particular form of stroke cancer. And he surmised something in chimney dust was, uh, was causing this uh, unusual form of cancer. Um, chance was known to play a role for a long time. There were people with no histories of cancer, no known exposures, uh, who would suddenly develop cancer. Um, and finally, Peyton Rouse um, uh, made the argument in uh, early 1900s that viruses were implicated in, 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 in the development of many cancers. Now, for a long time, the question was how you could, he, he could you know, square these four pieces that seemed very disparate. But of course, by the 1980s, if you suddenly understood that at the center of all of this were the genes in, in, in your cells, the mystery of multiple causes could be solved because heredity, you, can either, you could inherit the genes from your parents, you could uh, mutate the genes by, through, the, through environmental influences, such as uh, chimney suit or such as x-rays. Um, you could uh, develop mutations by virtue of chance when cells divide, like all copying machines, they make errors, so you could mutate the genes as a consequence of chance, and viruses could tamper with your genetic material or bring in foreign genetic material that would then thereby allow you to, to, to make a, a cell that is now carrying material, genetic material that is ultimately result, results in cancer. So everyone clear so far, this was a, a major moment for, for our field um, where the mystery of multiple causes was, was partly solved. And, and this gave rise to, I mean, this was coincident with, um, with, um, with, with, with the 1960s, uh, suddenly the locus of illness moving from uh, outside us uh, to inside us, um, uh, famously captured um, by the sentence, we have met the enemy and he is us. Um, from there on, that's sort of where our story takes off um, in terms of, of uh, risk and precision. Um, we knew by the 1980s and certainly by the early 1990s that, as I said before, gen genetic changes in cells was resp were responsible for the development of individual cancers. But the question then became, well, what is, what, what is the similarity or dif difference between two, for two breast cancers, say? Is it the same mutation? Is it one mutation per cancer? Is it a different set of mutations, five mutations for different cancers? Breast cancer has five, retinoblastoma has three, uh, sarcoma has seven. What, is the, what does the spectrum look like? And there were many, many ideas about this, um, but the real solution to this came from the genome projects. Uh, you know, we think about the Human Genome Project as um, a, a kind of, you know, end in itself. But of course, for, from the standpoint of a cancer biology, the Human Genome Project is just a template for the Cancer Genome Project, which is a mechanism or, or an effort to understand the diversity of cancers based on their genetic fingerprints or genetics. So again, this is a schematic here leading up to our, 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 our talk. But by the 1990s and early 2000s, we began to ask the question, if you take five specimens of breast cancer, so just restricting it to breast cancer, say, or five specimens of lung cancer, what is, we know that in all cases we'll find mutated genes, that's the central cause. Are they the same, are they different, how are they similar, how are they different? And here was the surprise, here was the, was the powerful message that came out of that story. So here's a, here's a schematic, here's a woman who comes into your clinic, um, let's say she has breast cancer, we're using that as an example still, um, and uh, we have the capacity, as we acquired, to map the genetic mutations in her cancer. So imagine that all her genes, uh, her genome is like a big snake that's um, crossing, crisscrossing this blank sheet of paper, and you find your capacity to map the genetic mutations that she has, this one woman has, um, in her breast cancer, and there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight genes that are mutated. The number can be anywhere between eight to 130. Um, so I've just chosen a simple example here. A second woman comes into your clinic, also has breast cancer, and previously would be, you know, we would look down the microscope and conclude that she had breast cancer. But now we look down the genetic microscope and find that she has a, a, a spectrum of mutations in her breast cancer, in her case also eight genes, but they're not the same eight as the first woman. And here's a third woman who comes in and they are, they're even more discordant to some extent. Now, what's interesting about this, and this turned out to be a principle which was true for virtually all cancers, not every cancer, but virtually uh, all, most common cancers um, in which 
the spectrum of genetic mutations or the individual fingerprint of genetic mutations for one cancer was not the same as a second cancer even within the same subtype. Is that clear? It's the foundation on which this talk is, is based. So that has to be very clear. Um, in other words, uh, two specimens of breast cancer, even though they might look similar under the microscope, carry different spectra of mutations in their genes, in their genomes. Um, we have never experienced, we have never encountered a disease with this level of genetic diversity in which every single example of that disease is its own example of that disease. And uh, we eventually found out that it's actually even true at a cellular level. If you take one tumor and you looked at the cells in that one tumor, it turns out that even there within that one tumor, uh, there, are, there are slightly different uh, variations in genetic mutations. So the level of genetic diversity goes right down to the cellular level, not just an individual level. So, one of the things that we began to do in the 1990s is to look at this data and throw our hands up and say, well, is there any possible way to organize this information so that at least we can be systematic about how to treat cancer, how to think about risk, how to think about genetic risk uh, for an individual cancer? And one way to organize this, of course, is to ask the question, well, what are the most frequent mutations? Here, here's one that's present in all three specimens. Here's another one that's present only in one specimen, not present in any other specimen. So can you now collapse all these charts and make a kind of landscape view of cancer? And this was what they actually looked like. This is colorectal cancer. And here you see common mutations, these big peaks uh, that are common across many, many individuals, individuals. And then you see rare ones. These white dots are mutations that occur only in one individual and not in any other individual. I hope this is uh, now clear in terms of what the actual diversity of cancers looks like, looked like at that point of time. So, um, and this is just to illustrate that you had all kinds of mutations. Some were common, some were less common, some were extremely uncommon in these cancers. So you could then begin to think about these cancer cells uh, or these cancers as a kind of malignant machine in which not one gene, but a kind of network of genes was communicating with each other, driving the physiology or the aberrant physiology of the cancer. It wasn't one gene per cancer. It was as if it was, there were parts or cogs to a machine in which parts of the machine were driving um, the physiology or the aberrant behavior of the cancer cell. Um, at that point of time, uh, a nihilist would say, you know, this is far too complicated. We cannot possibly make sense of this kind of information with every individual patient carrying individual mutations. But the field moved on, and we began to ask the question, what if we took, for instance, um, a genetic, uh, uh, sorry, not a genetic, but a therapy, and we matched the therapy, we found, we matched that therapy with the individual fingerprint of the cancer. In other words, instead of treating indiscriminately with chemotherapy, cell-destroying, cell-killing uh, compounds, chemicals, what if we found a way to target a particular Achilles heel, a particular weakness of one cancer, matching that weakness, that genetic weakness, with the therapy? So that if you had that genetic weakness in your, or genetic vulnerability in your cancer, you would benefit from the therapy. But if you didn't have it, you would not benefit from that therapy. And there are many examples of this, but the one I've chosen is Herceptin. Herceptin is a drug that attacks, um, antibody that attacks one particular genetic aberration in one kind, one subset of breast cancer. It will not work if you do not have that genetic aberration and therefore only uh, is, is a successful therapy for people who carry that genetic aberration. Um, and um, this is a picture that, uh, of Barbara Bradfield. Barbara Bradfield was in the first trial of Herceptin. This is the phase one, really a phase zero, phase one trial of Herceptin when, she, when, they, um, when they first launched the drug. She almost refused that. Her story is in my book. Um, I'd encourage you to, to she's, and she was interviewed also for, uh, for the film. Um, this was um, uh, about um, 18, 17 odd years ago. Um, was when she was first diagnosed with breast cancer. Um, she happened to be patient one on the trial. She also happened to be, have the best response to her septin in that entire study. Um, she almost refused to do it, uh, but ultimately it was a very persistent surgeon and a very persistent oncologist who kept calling her and saying, would you please enroll? Um, and she was gonna take, you know, she was gonna take juices in Mexico, but instead she went to LA and, um, and uh, became the first patient. She had metastatic, her two positive breast cancer and had a really a spectacular response um, and is actually alive today. 
So she has, is not only patient one, is actually the longest surviving human being to be on Herceptin therapy. But the principle of Herceptin therapy is just a principle. It's not, it's, it's, it doesn't apply, it, it applies across the board, which is that if you find a powerful molecular mechanism driving the genetic mechanism, driving the individual behavior or growth of a cancer cell, you can, on certain occasions, intervene. It proved the point that you could do this um, in a systematic way without giving toxic chemotherapy in isolation. Um, and this is actually from that pivotal trial. This was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, um, which showed very clearly these, is, this is, these are patients with disseminated or metastatic uh, HER2-positive breast cancer. You, if, you, what, what was very clear is that if you did not have the genetic uh, mutation or the vulnerability, you would not benefit from the treatment. In other words, those, those patients would look exactly the same. These are survival curves. People in the audience may be familiar with them, but these are survival curves starting with 100% survival, obviously, at the beginning of the trial. If you took no Herceptin, then you, and sadly, um, rapidly passed away uh, in the course of about 20 months. But with Herceptin, that was, uh, that was prolonged so significantly that, you know, you could do statistics on this, but you did not need statistics. Uh, we used to have a um, an instructor, I'm sure this has been said many times before, is that um, if you look at a, if you look at a, uh, a, a plot in, and you could put a finger between the two lines, you don't need to do st sophisticated statistics to figure out whether the, drug is, uh, whether the drug is working or not. That's true for penicillin. It's also true for Herceptin. Um, anyway, so back to Herceptin, also called trastuzumab. Um, but a second important principle fe fell out of that, and, and this now bring, deepens uh, us in our plot, which is that if you pa took patients with metastatic breast cancer, not, I'm sorry if that's not visible, but that's just metastatic breast cancer. So this is patients like Barbara Bradfield. Their cancer has been discovered, found late in the, in the journey of cancer, found late in um, their, 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 their history of cancer. Um, then certainly you found benefit. So this is patients uh, treated with or versus without Herceptin, and you can clearly see a massive uh, change in, in survival uh, of these patients. But, and there was a huge but here which we hadn't expected, it was really a surprise, and actually, uh, actually one of the most beautiful surprises in medicine, which is that if you now gave patients Herceptin after diagnosing early disease, that is they had had cancer detected in their, in their breast, um, and the surgeon removed that cancer. There was no physical sign or visible sign of cancer left in the body. So these people were at risk for metastatic disease if there were certain cells left over in their body. There, too, Herceptin was successful and, and in fact, remarkably successful. This is so-called adjuvant therapy for Herceptin. This is what we actually now routinely are giving. And that is patients who've had a primary breast tumor removed, sometimes small, sometimes big, genetically characterized, as I said before, so there we understand their genetic risk, and then give them a drug even if there is no sign of cancer left in their body. These people are technically disease-free. They have no evidence of disease. But we still gave them Herceptin to clear out remnant, dormant cancer cells uh, that we had been missed or somehow had escaped the local um, surgical excision. They too had benefit, and now, their survival climbed to about 93%. 90, now it's about 90, with new drugs, it's about 92%. That's an incredible number. In other words, 90 odd percent of women with a common variant of breast cancer, HER2 positive breast cancer, were having survivals, uh, in, in, as I said, in the 90% at five years. That's a transformational uh, therapy for cancer. And of course, there are other examples of this. They're not terribly common. We haven't achieved this in virtually, you know, we haven't achieved this in many cancers, but this was a very pivotal moment in, the, in 2005 when this trial first came out. And there grew from this, again, I'm not sure if you can see this, so sorry about the colors, but I'll read it out. But um, can you see this in the back? <coughs> yes, you can, okay. I can not see it. <laughs> I'm the only person. <laughs> so, um, but there grew an important idea, um, which, uh, which I discussed uh, recently at our main clinical oncology meeting, which is this idea of, of an experiment, which is, could we now imagine a world in which we detect cancer early and then personalize based on genetic assessment and then give some kind of targeted therapy or immunological therapy, could we now change the uh, direction of cancer? An experiment we have not. So again, and we then began to think of cancer as a disease of mitigated risk. Um, 
which is, can we reduce those at risk by identifying them? Can we detect early and identify those likely to progress? And then can we treat with the most effective least toxic therapy and maintain a response remission? It was a new kind of map of thinking about cancer. Rather than, you know, how do we attack and kill a tumor once it's spread all over the body, um, we, can we push this, the diagnostic clock backwards uh, do as minimal, minimal invasion, remove the primary tumor, characterize it genetically, and then deliver therapy. And of course, these come in doublets or pairs. Um, one of them has to do with risk, the second has to do with detection, the third has to do with therapy. Um, so this, in the, I would say, in the 2000s, we're in the 2000s now. Um, so what were, how do we identify people at risk? And we had, in fact, a traditional way of identifying people at risk. We called it taking a patient's history and physical. Um, you ask them questions about their own history, their family history. Um, we ask them questions about their exposures. Um, we ask them, we, we, we try to determine who is at a higher risk for this kind of cancer. In breast cancer, they had particular epidemiological studies that allowed us to find out women who were at higher or lower risk. And then we also ask questions about heredity. The problem was that once in a while, we would get powerful heredit hereditary stories. Mom, mom had breast cancer, grandma had breast cancer, paternal cousin, maternal cousin, et cetera. And when the histories were that strong, we began to identify single genes like BRCA1, like BRCA2, which would track those histories and allow us to enable us to understand why this particular woman in the clinic had breast cancer. That particular man in the clinic had an unusual sarcoma <laughs> because his father, his uncle, his uh, et cetera, had also had similar cancers. So we found single genetic vulnerabilities that tracked through families, but we were still lacking a kind of uh, a deep analysis of risk. Um, and, but we began to build, even from those simple ideas, uh, some sense of what might happen in the future, that history and genetics would somehow funnel into our assessment of risk, that we would then screen or biopsy these people, these patients. Um, if we had um, cancer detected, we would then deliver precision therapy. So this had, from that, from this days of Herceptin, we had taken yet another step towards trying to uh, diagnose cancer earlier, trying to intervene less, and trying to personalize or target the therapy. Um, since that time, 2005, 2006, another 10 odd years has passed. And now we're really deepening our understanding of these ideas. Um, and that's, this is where, my, where I'm kind of ending, going, going to end my, my, my talk. Um, and that is that we are finally moving from the simple assessment of genetic risk to the complex assessment of genetic risk. So I'll give you an example of this and, and now talk about some of, of the themes that are emerging in, in the future. So here is a simple uh, pedigree of breast cancer. This is a genetic risk for breast cancer carried in this case by the BRCA1 gene mutation. Most of you are familiar with it, but if you're not, think of it as a mutation that in carried across multiple generations that increases the risk of not just breast cancer, but also other cancers. Breast cancer in women, to some extent, uh, the other genes that have risk for men, um, but also other cancers that are, carry, that are increased in risk if you have the genetic mutation. This mutation was identified using very classical genetic studies. Um, and we, we actually, by 2005, 2006, we were actually tracking, had vast programs across the world in, in the UK, in Ireland, in, um, in, um, in Asia, certainly in the United States, um, cohorts of women with BRCA1 gene mutations who we were diagnosed as uh, carrying BRCA1 mutations and who we were following to find out what the best way to treat, survey, um, and, um, and understand the biology of these, uh, of these uh, patients. The word previvor came from that cohort, actually. These were the women who coined the word previvor to describe their sense or state in the world in which they felt they didn't have cancer, but they were under constant threat of cancer for future cancers occurring. So, but the problem was that if you took um, 100 women um, with familial breast cancer, so you know that there's a family history of breast cancer, and ask the question, how many of those can be explained by single gene mutations like BRCA1 or BRCA2? You're only stuck with about 25, 30%. 75% .00 of those 100, 75 of those 100 women we knew had familial risk. Their pedigree actually might look exactly like this. Uh, you know, grandmother with breast cancer, mother, cousin, et cetera, with breast cancer. 
But we had no way of, of diagnosing those people because we didn't know what the risk was carried by. We didn't know what the genes were. Um, and we knew that it wasn't one gene because of the nature of the, of the, of the pedigrees, but we, we didn't know what the risk would be. And again, from the, from the, from the community of, 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 of women uh, with familial breast cancer came the word BRCA3, uh, BRCA3 to describe not BRCA1 and BRCA2, but BRCA3 as a kind of shadow uh, of genetic shadow that you couldn't put your hands on, you couldn't put your finger on, but existed. We knew it existed because you could see it in the family history, but you couldn't. Uh, a woman would come and say, look, I have a family history of breast cancer. What should I do? And we could not say, you know, your risk is heightened compared to your sister uh, because we had no idea what the genes was. No, there was no real way to assess those genes. So one of the things that's happened in that period of time is that we're now entering an arena in which we are diagnosing, understanding this risk in complex through complex genetics. Uh, it's not one gene, but maybe 100, maybe 200, maybe 500 genes, each of which increases, contributes to a tiny increase in risk. It's like death by a 1,000 cuts. And, and the cumulative risk may, may rise to a woman who has just that one powerful BRCA1 gene mutation. But it's carried not by one gene, but by hundreds, maybe even on sometimes up to 1,000 genes. And the paradigm for that might be human height. So human height is a great example. So highly heritable, tall parents tend to produce tall children, shorter parents tend to produce shorter children. But in all the efforts to find you know, determinant, genetic determinants of human height, we'd only found a smattering, right? Some very extreme cases, Marfan syndrome, you know, could identify single genetic changes which increase height. But you know, it was very hard to explain such a common phenomenon as human height based on genetic analysis. Well, that began to change and really was, was one of the models um, for this. So I'll give you this one example. This actually this paper uh, I found while looking through the, uh, I've been interested in human height, not for personal reasons, but, uh, <laughs> but, um, but I've been interested in human height for exactly this characteristic because although it seems so far away from cancer, it is in fact carries all the lessons that we have to learn in cancer and genetic risk. Here's a paper um, based on the UK Biobank in which several hundred thousand now, uh, human beings' a sequence was deposited along with lots of biometric uh, data, heights, um, age, risk of cancer, ovarian cancer, breast cancer, other things. Um, and you could now use standard computational technologies to go and ask the question, can you reconstruct from the genetic architecture what their features will be? Um, so here is height. I, I found this, I, this, this study has so many consequences and so many ethical consequences, it really boggles the mind. But anyway, here is the algorithm. Here's an algorithm that was developed from, by uh, a group. Um, here's the actual height, and here's the predicted height. Now remember, we are basing this just on genetic information alone. In other words, if this, this was an infant in, in, in utero, this would be based on a drop of blood that came from uh, the, the infant's bloodstream. If this was a fingerprint or a brush of DNA that was found, it would be based on just that, not knowing who the person was. And this algorithm performs remarkably well. So a perfect fit would be a straight line going up, um, and this is what the actual fit is. Um, in other words, you could now get to a place where within about half a centimeter, or maybe about you know, five, six centimeters uh, at, the, at, the, at the far limit, you can diagnose human height based on just genetic information alone. Um, of course, it's a, you know, still much to be refined. Uh, we don't know if this is a, a, applicable across all geographic populations, so mu much to be done here. But nonetheless, and what's interesting about it is that in this case, three to 5,000 genes were involved. So 10% of, uh, of our genetic, 10 odd percent of our genetic uh, variability uh, was required to explain the variation in human height. Then things got close to home. This is breast cancer, uh, using now um, not machine learning, but simple additive learning. Still a complicated algorithm. So um, here is the genetic risk for breast cancer, again from the same cohort. Uh, I'll give you one example from heart disease, and then go on to breast cancer in a second. So here is heart disease. This is the population, right? Here's a tiny top 2.5% of the population that has a score up to fourfold. So in other words, here is a person who sits in this genetic risk category who has um, 
eightfold the risk of cardiovascular disease compared to uh, the rest of the population. They have eight, eight to tenfold the risk. And you can do the same for breast cancer. These are people who don't have the BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes, but have on the order of hundreds of individual genetic mutations, uh, genetic variations that are adding up to um, the risk. Um, so here's one example in breast cancer. Um, you don't have to focus on all the details, but this is the top 0.25% of the distribution. That top 2.5% of the distribution carries five-fold or 4.5-fold the risk of breast cancer compared to everyone else. So this is BRCA3. These women have that, that long sought after BRCA3. And there will be even deeper refinements. There will be women in the top top 0.125% of the population who will have sevenfold the risk or ninefold the risk compared to everyone else. Is everyone following all of this, by the way? Sorry. Um, so, and here's for, here, this is for obesity, by the way. This is for obesity. Uh, highly heritable, top 0.25% of the population carries 6.77% of risk. So you could identify a person likely to become obese and have all the future risks and diseases associated with obesity in utero based on risk assessment of this form. Again, has to be extrapolated to a wider population. But you can already start seeing what this world is begin beginning to look like, in which you are beginning to parse future illness before the illness has occurred. And that genetics is not the only, I'll take a small detour, but genetics is not the only way, of course, to understand future risk. This is an actual case. This is my friend, uh, Will Kierski. Um, this is a picture of Will taken uh, um, about five years ago. He's a, obviously a young man. This was taken at a wedding of a friend of his. Um, and if you look carefully, you would see his mother dug up these pictures for me. If you look carefully, there'd be two lesions, one here and one over here. Um, uh, one of them is malignant. Uh, it turned out to be a malignant melanoma. Um, and uh, we now know from work done, actually now repeated uh, a couple of times, that you can use just the imaging alone, um, potentially even an imaging from a high resolution photograph, to diagnose malignant versus benign lesions by using an algorithm by itself, a, a deep learning or a machine learning algorithm can diagnose these. Now, to me, I've seen hundreds, maybe a several hundred melanomas. I could not tell you for, without a pathologist's help, for the life of me, why this lesion is malignant while, while that lesion is benign. They look exactly the opposite to me. But this algorithm can. This algorithm classified based on 500,000 pictures of uh, melanoma to distinguish between malignant and benign uh, lesions. Um, and one thing I always tell, again, the residents just to scare them, uh, to scare the bejesus out of them, is that when, the, when they start learning, learning, they start with, they go from the first case they see goes, takes them from a case study of zero to a case study of one. When I add one more case to this computer database, it goes from case study of 500,000 to 500,001. So um, you can imagine that the accumulative learning uh, for this is enormous. Um, and this is a, we will, I suspect, fuse with these detec detection devices like chimeras uh, in order to carry forward uh, the next generation of dermatopathologic diagnosis and other diagnosis. This is another study. This is all coming out of Stanford, um, um, Sebastian Thrun's work, which attempts to do this for pancreatic cancer, cancer that's been very, very hard to detect, as, as many of you know. This actually, actually is a fascinating device who knows whether it's going to work or not, so I don't want to push it. But this is a device that scans you. It's, a, it's built into a bathtub. So it's an ultrasound device that you would enter every day, and that would survey you silently, um, and, and then use a, 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 a learning algorithm to figure out whether you had some changes, which would then prompt uh, bi surveillance, biopsy, and so forth. Um, and then finally, I wanted to talk about this, which is um, a very impressive early data from a actually several projects, which uses liquid biopsies to uh, deepen your understanding of risk. So again, going down the process, you identify a person with a genetic risk for breast cancer or lung cancer. You then enter some kind of surveillance program, it may be a scanning program, might be a way to follow you metabolically. In this case, it, this takes uh, DNA, floating DNA from your, from your body, and asks the question, is there, some, is there a hint or a sign of malignancy arising in that DNA. If there is, can we track it down to find out where that is? And if there is, can we actually remove it? Um, obviously, and cannot be emphasized enough, uh, 
these studies have to be carried out in full because we don't know whether these cancers that we're detecting are real or not. Are they likely to cause disease? Are they not? Are we just detecting thin air? Are we detecting because we are for the sake of detecting? And that's the problem of overdiagnosis and overtreatment that has been raised many, many times in, in the process. Um, and finally, if you do find a cancer, um, who is the person likely to progress? Um, uh, this, is, this is an area that actually I work on most, most actively in, in blood cancers. Um, but again, to find mechanisms to identify people who are likely to have metastatic or advanced disease versus those cancers that are not likely to progress. Um, and one of the things that that has brought forward is the final frontier of, of risk, which is that it's not just genetics, it's not just the genome, but it's the cells that surround the cancer. Um, here is uh, the first uh, immunological therapy for lung cancer, which is directed not at the lung cancer itself, but at waking up the immune system that surrounds the lung cancer and delivering uh, an immunological hit, a T cell hit to the lung cancer. Um, and that was very successful in, 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 in smoking-related lung cancer. This is the pivotal trial uh, that showed that. Um, and so, uh, as I said, precision therapies used to be about genes and genomes. It is increasingly about things outside the tumor, including the immune system, the tissue, the organ, the host, and in the future, the microbial environment that we live in, really early days uh, to detect uh, that. So um, it, as, we, as, we, as we hurtle towards the end, I, I, I was reminded of this, uh, of this famous, uh, being a New Yorker, I couldn't resist a, a cartoon from the New Yorker, which is, uh, this cartoon is called The View from Ninth Avenue. Um, it was uh, uh, drawn by, uh, by Steinberg. From, from Ninth Avenue, the only thing you can really see is 10th Avenue, that's Europe. Um, uh, sorry, that's Texas, that's Kansas City, that's Nebraska, that's China, Japan, uh, Russia, and somewhere in the distance is um, you know, the rest of the world. And if you were to look this way, you'd see you know, a speck of Ireland, a speck of uh, Europe, and then further out into, into, into nowhere. Um, for, for us, for a long time, the situation uh, was that we were stuck with just the genome as a locus for risk. Um, and cells, patients, the environments, host, metabolism, micro, could be, yeah, you know, could be Russia and Japan as far as we were concerned. But that has, is changing. Now we are beginning to suddenly understand risk not only as genetic risk, but as things that are much more proximal. What is the environment of the tumor? Can we change that? Does, is that telling us something about whether the patient is likely to progress or not? Are there people in this audience who have incipient cancers? And the answer is yes. Who are controlling their cancers by virtue of something that's active in their immunological milieu? If we could find that substance, if we could find that thing, could we take you into a different category of someone who's li unlikely to have genetic risk? Uh, but of course, it would be a, 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 a more physiological, a, a microenvironmental cellular factor that we would identify. This is active work. This is work that we are doing. This, my, my lab is very much involved in, in trying to understand, um, understand particularly the metabolism and the patient-host relationships here. So um, um, to come back then to this kind of idea um, that ultimately we would use our understanding of history and genetics to funnel through a kind of uh, system by which we would enter deeper and deeper understanding, deeper and deeper categorization, a kind of report card con containing both genes and microenvironmental features that would allow us to, um, to deepen our understanding of those who are likely to have cancer. Uh, I want to end, th therefore, with a, with a quote that I, that, that I, I with, with, a, with an important book that I read much later, um, and I couldn't help but remember the striking parallels to cancer. Um, and that is uh, the idea uh, of a total institution. Irving Goffman, the sociologist, coined the, the idea of a total institution, which is a place of work or residence where a great number of similarly situated people cut off from a wider community for a considerable time, together lead an enclosed, formally administered, and I would say formally surveyed uh, kind of life or round of life. Um, uh, this total institution, Goffman used it to refer to penalizing institutions like prisons, like um, uh, cults like concentration camps. Um, but I wonder whether we are subtly, as we widen or dilate the surveillance of cancer, um, we are also entering cancer as a total institution. I'm an oncologist. Uh, let me be very clear. No one, I'm sure, and we all would be, we would be thrilled. We would thrill to the prospect uh, 
of being able to prevent and diagnose cervical cancer before it took, took hold of your body. We would be thrilled, we would be, we, would be, we, would, we would thrill to the prospect of ovarian cancer diagnosed before it had metastasized into the momentum. We would, we, we, our dreams would come true if we could find gastric cancer before it fell, fell off the stomach and fell into the, the peritoneal cavity and caused uh, diffusely metastatic gastric cancer that we cannot treat today. Um, but uh, that moment comes uh, with, with, a, uh, with a cultural interception, with an understanding of the body, which we are yet to be uh, fully uh, aware of. Um, so I return then back to Stephen Shapin's quote, which is, um, the understanding of a world of, of cancer as a manageable chronic condition, but a risk factor world uh, would not be. Um, and um, and I, to, to end, just recall that, that these, um, the, the confiscation of these passports between the kingdom of the well and the kingdom of the ill, of the Ill um, making just a one-way street carries consequences not only for medicine, but for society and the world at large. Thank you, thank you very much.